Fortunes that are acquired through cooperative effort inflict no scars upon the hearts of their owners, which is more than can be said of fortunes that are acquired through conflict and competitive methods that border on extortion. The accumulation of material wealth, whether the object is that of bare existence or luxury, consumes most of the time that we put into this earthly struggle. If we cannot change this materialistic tendency of human nature, we can at least change the method of pursuing it by adopting cooperation as the basis of the pursuit. Cooperation offers the twofold reward of providing one with both the necessities and the luxuries of life, and the peace of mind which the covetous never know. The avaricious and covetous person may amass a great fortune in material wealth. There is no denying this fact, but he will have sold his soul for a mess of pottage in the bargain. Let us keep in mind the fact that all success is based upon power, and power grows out of knowledge that has been organized and expressed in terms of action. The world pays for but one kind of knowledge, and that is the kind which is expressed in terms of constructive service. In addressing the graduating class of a business college, one of the best-known bankers in America said, You ought to feel proud of your diplomas, because they are evidence that you have been preparing yourselves for action in the great field of business. One of the advantages of a business college training is that it prepares you for action, not to belittle other methods of education, but to exalt the modern business college method, I am reminded to say that there are some colleges in which the majority of the students are preparing for practically everything else except action. You came to this business college with but one object in view, and that object is to learn to render service and earn a living. The latest style of clothing has been of little interest to you because you have been preparing yourself for work in which clothes of the latest style will play no important part. You did not come here to learn how to pour tea at an afternoon party, nor to become masters at affecting friendliness while inwardly feeling envy for those who wear finer gowns and drive costly motor cars. You came here to learn how to work. In the graduating class before which this man spoke were thirteen boys, all of whom were so poor that they had barely enough money with which to pay their way. Some of them were paying their own way by working before and after school hours. That was twenty-five years ago. Last summer I met the president of the business college which these boys attended, and he gave me the history of each one of them from the time that they graduated until the time when I talked to him. One of them is the president of one of the big wholesale drug companies and a wealthy man. One is a successful lawyer. Two own large business colleges of their own. One is a professor in the Department of Economics in one of the largest universities in America. One is the president of one of the large automobile manufacturing companies. Two are presidents of banks and wealthy men. One is the owner of a large department store. One is the vice president of one of the great railway systems of the country. One is a well-established certified public accountant. One is dead. And the thirteenth is compiling this reading course in the law of success. Eleven successes out of a class of thirteen boys is not a bad record, thanks to the spirit of action developed by that business college training. It is not the schooling you have had that counts. It is the extent to which you express that which you learned from your schooling through well-organized and intelligently directed action. By no means would I belittle higher education, but I would offer hope and encouragement to those who have had no such education, provided they express that which they know, be it ever so little, in intensive action along constructive lines. One of the greatest presidents who ever occupied the White House had but little schooling, but he did such a good job of expressing what knowledge he acquired by that little schooling through properly directed action that his name has been inseparably woven into the history of the United States. Quibbling over salary to start with has lost many a man the big opportunity of a lifetime. If the position you seek is one that you know you can throw your whole heart into, take it, even if you have to work for nothing until you deliver a good sample of your goods. Thereafter you will receive pay in proportion to the quality and quantity of the work you perform. Every city, town, and hamlet has its population of those well-known characters called ne'er-do-wells, 
and if you will analyze these unfortunate people, you will observe that one of their outstanding features is procrastination. Lack of action has caused them to slip backward until they got into a rut, where they will remain unless through accident they are forced out into the open road of struggle where unusual action will become necessary. Don't let yourself get into such a condition. Every office and every shop and every bank and every store and every other place of employment has its outstanding victims of procrastination who are doing the goose-step down the dusty road of failure because they have not developed the habit of expressing themselves in action. You can pick out these unfortunates all about you if you will begin to analyze those with whom you come in contact each day. If you will talk to them, you will observe that they have built up a false philosophy somewhat of this nature. I am doing all I am paid to do, and I am getting by. Yes, they are getting by, but that is all they are getting. Some years ago, at a time when labor was scarce and wages unusually high, I observed scores of able-bodied men lying about in the parts of Chicago, doing nothing. I became curious to know what sort of an alibi they would offer for their conduct, so I went out one afternoon and interviewed seven of them. With the aid of a generous supply of cigars and cigarettes and a little loose change, I bought myself into the confidence of those whom I interviewed and thereby gained a rather intimate view of their philosophy. All gave exactly the same reason for being there, without employment. They said, the world will not give me a chance. Think of it, the world would not give them a chance. Of course the world wouldn't give them a chance. It never gives anyone a chance. A man who wants a chance may create it through action, but if he waits for someone to hand it to him on a silver platter, he will meet with disappointment. I fear that this excuse that the world does not give a man a chance is quite prevalent, and I strongly suspect that it is one of the commonest causes of poverty and failure. The seventh man that I interviewed on that well-spent afternoon was an unusually fine-looking specimen, physically. He was lying on the ground asleep with the newspaper over his face. When I lifted the paper from his face, he reached up, took it out of my hands, and put it back over his face and went right on sleeping. Then I used a little strategy by removing the paper from his face and placing it behind me where he could not get it. He then sat up on the ground, and I interviewed him. That fellow was a graduate from two of the greatest universities of the East, with a master's degree from one and a Ph.D. from the other. His story was pathetic. He had held job after job, but always his employer or his fellow employee had it in for him. He hadn't been able to make them see the value of his college training. They wouldn't give him a chance. Here was a man who might have been at the head of some great business or the outstanding figure in one of the professions, had he not built his house upon the sands of procrastination and held to the false belief that the world should pay him for what he knew. Luckily, most college graduates do not build upon such flimsy foundations, because no college on earth can crown with success the man who tries to collect for that which he knows, instead of that which he can do with what he knows. The psychology of inaction is one of the chief reasons why some towns and cities are dying with the dry rot. Take the city of X, for example. You'll recognize the city by its description, if you are familiar with this part of the country. Sunday blue laws have closed up all the restaurants on Sunday. Railroad trains must slow down to twelve miles an hour while passing through the city. Keep off the grass signs are prominently displayed in the parks. Unfavorable city ordinances of one sort or another have driven the best industries to other cities. On every hand one may see evidence of restraint. The people of the streets show signs of restraint in their faces and in their manner and in their walk. The mass psychology of the city is negative. The moment one gets off the train at the depot, this negative atmosphere becomes depressingly obvious and makes one want to take the next train out again. The place reminds one of a graveyard, and the people resemble walking ghosts. They register no signs of action. The bank statements of the banking institutions reflect this negative, inactive state of mind. The stores reflected in their show windows and in the faces of their salespeople. I went into one of the stores to buy a pair of hose. A young woman with bobbed hair, who would have been a flapper if she hadn't been too lazy, threw out a box of hose on the counter. 
When I picked up the box, looked the hose over, and registered a look of disapproval on my face, part of the country, prevalent, and I strongly suspect that it is one of the commonest causes of poverty and failure. The seventh man that I interviewed on that well-spent afternoon was an unusually fine-looking specimen, physically. He was lying on the ground asleep with the newspaper over his face. When I lifted the paper from his face, he reached up, took it out of my hands, and put it back over his face and went right on sleeping. Then I used a little strategy by removing the paper from his face and placing it behind me where he could not get it. He then sat up on the ground, and I interviewed him. That fellow was a graduate from two of the greatest universities of the East, with a master's degree from one and a Ph.D. from the other. His story was pathetic. He had held job after job, but always his employer or his fellow employee had it in for him. He hadn't been able to make them see the value of his college training. They wouldn't give him a chance. Here was a man who might have been at the head of some great business or the outstanding figure in one of the professions had he not built his house upon the sands of procrastination and held to the false belief that the world should pay him for what he knew. Luckily, most college graduates do not build upon such flimsy foundations, because no college on earth can crown with success the man who tries to collect for that which he knows instead of that which he can do with what he knows.